Harry Corgi. You need a grooming. You need to brush up. You need to brush up? <laughs> Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T-Touch practitioner for animals and people. And this is Tristan. He's a corgi, and we're here for another episode of Conversations with a Corgi. And yesterday, we wrapped up a section of talks about emotion code work, and we looked at some ways with this work that you can release trapped emotions from your pet. Well, not you personally, but that trapped emotions can be released from your pet using this work. And there are practitioners around the world. Um, not all of them work with animals specifically, but certainly you can reach me at www.sallymorganpt.com. And today I've been thinking for a few months that we might have a, not a series, but an occasional book review. And I have been working on my TED talk, as many of you know, which is about why and how we need connections with animals and how to do that. And I was writing a section about dog in, and human and horse intelligence yesterday. And I was um, reminded of this brilliant book that I read about two years ago. And I highly recommend it. Um, it was so good that when it came out, I bought it in the hardbound edition. It's called Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel. And it's got these beautiful elephants on the cover. And it is written by um, someone named Carl Safina. And Carl Safina hosted a whole PBS series about his brilliant work over many years with sea life. And let's see, his PBS series was called Saving the Ocean with Carl Safina. And he lives on Long Island and he is well known for his sea life research. And um, you know, he's been working in the field a long time. His TED talk, by the way, um, about this book, Beyond Words, um, and his last name is spelled S-A-F-I-N-A. -A. His TED Talk is one of the best ones I've ever seen. Like, it's very inspiring to anyone who loves animals to listen to what Carl has to say about animals. So what this book does is tell us more about the inner life of animals from a researcher's perspective. And he looks specifically at elephants, which we saw on the cover of the book, wolves and killer whales and what he does is go to a place where there are researchers who have been looking at this animal species for a number of years and to talk to them about the kind of things that you can't say really on the record in terms of being a researcher like what is going on in these animals individual personalities and their emotional lives and how do they really think and feel and what have you observed that is not strictly speaking research and this is something that's near and dear to my heart temple grandin wrote about this and dispelled a lot of prior research in one of her books back in the early 2000s um, showing how there were flaws in many research studies she has that kind of mind that can just see where there's a mistake in a setup of a research study to prove or disprove animal intelligence and so her book is um, a precursor to a lot of the research we've had these days but what Carl talks about in particular here um, are the stories of the lives of these specific animals and the elephant groups um, he observes, you know, with his observational skills, he's honed over years and years of working in the field in um, the sea. And he can see how elephants help each other um, with baby care, how they grieve when another elephant is killed, um, how they interact with other groups of elephants and you know they are known to be one of the most intelligent animals on earth and it's just our lack of intelligence that makes it so that we don't appreciate that but i certainly do and i'm sure anyone listening to this also can appreciate the intelligence of animals and so um, i just want to read you a little section here biscuit what do you have to say in this section, he's talking about killer whales. He says, human awareness is present without words. Words are one attempt to capture our consciousness. Nonverbal animals experience pure consciousness. Eventually, Parfit, he's a researcher who has looked at killer whales up in the Northeast, 
realized that he had finally looked through otherness. He no longer saw something that didn't look human. He didn't see a killer whale. He saw Luna, a specific whale. When I myself look at other animals, I almost never see an otherness. I see the overwhelming similarities. They fill me with a sense of deep relation. Nothing makes me more at home in the world than the company of wild relatives. Nothing else except the deepest human love feels as right, as connected, and puts me at so much peace. So those are important words to see what the tone of this book is. And certainly for these wolves at Yellowstone, um, there have been many interviews with some of the park rangers who have been at Yellowstone for years who knew about this particular wolf. Um, and I can't even remember what, she, she wasn't given a name, like, you know, when you're researching, you don't often give animals a name, their numbers, um, and, and thank God there's been a revolution, like now whales and killer whales who are identified by their flukes have got names now, so it's easier to keep track of them, and then their groups all have like the same letter at the start of their name, and so animals are being given, um, you know, characteristics that you would associate with someone with a name just by giving them a name. Naming makes a big difference. So anyway, with these wolves, there was one particular female wolf in a pack who was extremely brilliant, extremely beautiful, and extremely fast. And she did very, very well. And there was another pack of wolves in Yellowstone that was a little more roughshod, a little more um, fierce with other wolves, and a little less methodical in their killing and just kind of like the bad guys in the area. And, uh, at, and this wolf had lived so long, this female wolf in her pack, she had protected them so well and she was so intelligent about keeping them safe. And she indeed, I think, was one of the longest lived wolves that they've recorded at Yellowstone. And the, he tells a story, um, the park ranger to Carl, about one extraordinary day when this fierce pack was attacking this female wolf's pack and it looked like she was gonna die. They were chasing her up toward a cliff where she would plummet to her death. And, you know, she was with some of her other pack members and, you know, they were gradually peeling off and hiding from this fierce pack. And what happened was she had a daughter who was one or two, very strong, quick wolf. And she came running in from behind the other attacking pack and got them to follow her and, uh, and then did a leap off the cliff into a little ledge where she could easily get down. And many of this attacking pack went over the cliff. And this level of intelligence and thought and communication between the original female wolf and the second wolf, her, her daughter, uh, was just incredible. And sadly, um, and you know, you can't interfere with the lives of wild animals, but the park ranger was very sad to see that this particular wolf was getting closer and closer to the edge of the protected area of the park. And as many of you realize, there's so much controversy about the wolves in Yellowstone anyway. And uh, as she got closer to the edge, the local farmers were very upset. Coyotes actually do most of the killing of livestock, not wolves, but Anyway, she eventually uh, lost some pack members and then eventually she was killed. And it was devastating to this researcher and park ranger who had known her for so many years and he has story after story of her intelligence and communication with her pack and just, you know, beautiful stories of her care with her pups. And Carl captures a lot of that in this book, Beyond Words. And I heard a wonderful interview about this wolf on NPR. And I mean, she is just a remarkable individual, but in fact, all animals are remarkable individuals if we take the time to um, come close to them and observe them and see how they really have lives that we are just so unaware of, and even our pets. Um, and on the same note, um, I just heard something this morning on another book, which I will soon feature when I get it and read it. The woman that wrote, um, the, is it The Private Life of Dogs, The Hidden Life of Dogs, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, she has a new book out. Again, like me, she's just a careful observer of the animals in her life and a writer. And in this new book, she has a friend who has chickens. 
and she describes this person with the chickens who has really got a close bond with her hens. She has been um, taking care of them since they were little peeps and she goes out every day to feed them and care for them and protect them. And so this neighbor, just like I do with dogs, do you know that your dog has different barks for different things? Try listening to your dog closely and see if there's a different bark when the UPS people come or when another dog walks down the street or when he's barking when you're playing with him. Really pay attention because dogs have different types of barks for different things. So this woman noticed that when she walked into the hen yard, one chicken was making like a different sound. She had never heard the chickens make and she started to pay attention. And over the course of just a couple of days, she realized that that cluck was only made when she was there and she thought, oh my gosh, I think that's the chickens communication with each other about me. I think that's my name or my presence described in chicken language. And what a brilliant thing for someone to notice. And certainly we are all capable of noticing these subtle things in our own pets. And this is part of what Carl Safina writes about in his book, Observing you know, Wildlife, that has been known to researchers for years and years. I mean, killer whales live a long time and have many experiences with humans. And it's very interesting how you can watch them devastatingly kill a seal but then swim next to a small boat of humans and make no attempt to topple that boat or eat the humans. Like what is going on with them that they understand us in spite of the fact that we've killed them for hundreds of years. So um, these chickens are just incredible. And to observe that your chickens are saying your name or a word for you, um, and people think chickens aren't smart, but in fact they are, all animals are. We are just unable to recognize that. She also talks about rats in this book and how they laugh and how they dream from MRI studies. So it's really interesting what is going on finally in the world of animals. And it's with people who are not necessarily doing quote unquote research because you can't really observe an animal's inner life and their personality if they're held captive in some kind of a research setting. So it's really um, a wonderful change that we're seeing and um, I'm so glad that there are many people in this field now, not just me. <laughs> and thank God because some of them like Carl, he's a much more prolific writer and well-known speaker than I will uh, probably ever be. So another thing I wanna read to you from his book relates specifically to people like us. When my experiences with dogs and other animals and people were fewer, I used to think it was silly for people to speak of dogs as family or other animals as friends. Now I know it's silly not to. I'd overestimated the loyalty and staying power of humans and underestimated the intelligence and sensitivity of other animals. I think I understand both better now. Their gifts overlap, but they are different gifts. There is no better prayer to morning than to feel glad to know the greatest story is that all life is one. And that um, leads to another book that we'll talk about another time. But this book, Beyond Words, is just magic. And I'm sure it's, it came out about two years ago. I'm sure there are many used copies available on eBay and Amazon now so that you can um, also, and it's, I'm sure it's in libraries if you want to really be economical about checking out this book, but I think it really gets to some important points about animals. And in the end of the book, when he's talking about uh, the killer whales up in the Northeast, um, in order to protect them, the rules about humans interacting with them have gotten so tight that um, this poor guy that's been researching them forever, he has a house looking down over the sound where he can see the whales and he's observed them for so long it's like his friends are down there really like we would feel about you know our horses or our dogs or our cats or our rabbits and he can no longer do a lot of the things he did with them um, you know they've done things like calling them to boats with calls of recorded family members um, they've observed how they react when um, there's different types of killer whale pods. There are some pods like those wolves that are more fierce than others. And then there are these really tight family units, which, you know, until we had really close observational research like this guy was doing, we wouldn't have known these things. And it's so important to understand the complex lives of our animals. 
And so this researcher um, that he mentions is just sort of in mourning because he, his relationship with these animals has been interrupted by the many laws governing how close he can get, you know, where he can be with them, how he can watch them. And it's only owing to his lifetime of work with them that he is able to um, still provide information about their lives and their behavior that can help us. So I give um, a lot of credit to Carl for writing this book. I'll tell you another little section in the beginning here that describes it. Beyond Words brings forth powerful and illuminating insight into the unique personalities of animals through extraordinary stories of animal joy, grief, jealousy, anger, and love. The similarity between human and non-human consciousness, self-awareness, and empathy calls us to reevaluate how we interact with animals as Safina thoughtfully tackles issues that affect all of us. It is a wonderful book. I can't recommend it enough to any animal lover. And of course, there are so many books available now, but if you are looking for a good read when you hunker down with the winter weather, um, this book will really warm your heart. And um, I certainly benefited greatly from reading it. It's just so wonderful to finally have people that agree with you <laughs> when you read the book and you say, that's right, animals do have feelings and personalities and emotional lives, and they are really badly affected by a lot of the things we do. And why are killer whales and other whales indeed not toppling over our boats and eating us and indeed instead saving us? Dolphins have rescued dogs and humans that have fallen into the sea. Why do they do this? We have not been kind to them. They have so much more generosity and in fact, there's been research studies that, as you listen to my other episode, about dogs being altruistic and more compassionate towards other beings than even some humans, certainly than some humans. So um, I want to highly recommend this book today to you, Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel by Carl Safina. And if you can't get the book, do check out his TED Talk. You can just Google Carl Safina TED Talk and it will come up. It's a wonderful talk. He's a great speaker, and um, I encourage you to check out this book. So Tristan and I give this book review. Like two paws up. Two paws up. He says, I can't really lift my paws, Mom. I'm falling. Two paws up for Carl. Yay! And a lot of what has affected Carl in his book um, is his observation of his dogs, and he writes about that at the end of the book, and seeing their intelligent and and deep um, emotional lives has made him understand more about animals and certainly his observations of sea life over the years have touched him deeply as well. So check out this book. We have a bunch of stuff to do today. We have to finish working on our TED Talk and we are going out to the farmer's market to get some apples because my favorite apples are back in season still about 80 here in New England today. I'm so happy because I don't feel like we had summer, although it's still cloudy. And we will be back tomorrow with another episode of Conversations with a Corgi at around 9.25 a.m. So thanks for joining us today. Here we go. This, there's the music. Thanks for joining us in this episode of Conversations with a Corgi. We talked about Carl Safina's brilliant book, Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. And stay safe if you're in the south part of the United States where Nate's coming in. Oh my gosh, another hurricane. <laughs>